because they were arguing all the time about money because he had decided to make a living as a painter, giving up his job, and she had to bring up five children on, and the money was dwindling away and they were both bad at housekeeping and, and they argued a lot. Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. The clip you heard at the beginning of this episode is from Meta Borgar, who is the great-granddaughter of the, the great artist. Now, I hope when you listen to that clip, you initially thought that she was talking, or she was sort of referring to Gauguin's relationship with Vincent van Gogh. In other words, that they were arguing about money, that they weren't very good at keeping the house sort of um, neat and tidy or whatever, just maintaining the household. And then it turned out that she was, she was talking about his wife at the time, who had five children and how they were arguing uh, um, about money. And so the odds are that if Gorgal was arguing with his own wife about money and kind of cleaning up the house, that when he stayed with Van Gogh, probably they argued about the same thing. Of course, that's not good enough. We don't want to speculate. We want to be sure. And in this episode, we are going to get some certainty on what the arguments were about. But more in particular, what kind of guy was Gauguin and how was he not like Van Gogh? And that is going to give us a better idea of what Van Gogh is like. So what I want to do in this episode is split it really into two sections. The one section dealing with Gorgar's journey to the Yellow House and a little bit of time that he spent in the Yellow House. And we'll refer to a article in the, in the Guardian citing a letter that both Vincent van Gogh and Gorgar wrote while they lived together. So that's quite interesting. And then we're going to go to how he sort of left, what happened after he left the Yellow House, what did he go and do? And that's also going to re reveal quite a lot about Gorgar's temperament. In the movie At Eternity's Gate, I kind of complained that the character playing Gorgar just seemed a bit too neat, too clean shaven or whatever it was too kind and nice or whatever and I guess if there's a problem with the movie Gorgar Voyage to Tahiti it is that he's just he seems too rough around the edges he seems too sickly and and kind of like a bum right in the movie one of the first kind of character references to Gorgon and, and he is portrayed by the French actor Vincent Cassel. He is um, described by his peers in the movie as a savage, almost in a fun way. You know, you're a savage, you're, you're someone who is interested in living primitively, right? And bear in mind that we know that Gorgon was a pugilist, he, he, he was interested in boxing and fencing, he kind of had a, a sweaty approach to life and art, which in a way was similar to Van Gogh in the sense that Van Gogh quite liked the peasant approach, or also the sort of sweaty laborer scenario, but it's a little bit different. Um, Gorgar's approach was, although it was, he was sort of interested in, in being rustic, I think he was also interested in being hedonistic and decadent and he wanted to indulge in certain desires. And, and the question is, how is Gorgar's hedonism different to Van Gogh's? Unfortunately, the movie Voyage to Tahiti isn't a very good film. It doesn't really address much of Gorgar's life story except the Tahiti section 
And if I can just summarize it in one or two sentences, basically he goes to Tahiti with high hopes. He's, so, he's soon down on his luck. He kind of has a heart attack. His doctor says he should sort of um, rest or something. And then he sort of goes out into the mountains and, and he's kind of on his last legs. He's sort of, he, he can barely walk. He's, a, he's, he's kind of about to die. And he sort of stumbles upon this tribe kind of in the mountains. And he's starving. He, he thought he could hunt and, and catch fish and game. And he's just terrible at it. You know, just shows you that as an artist, he's, he's suffering from some illusions and delusions. You know, he, he thinks it's quite simple to live off the wild. He goes there and he's soon barely alive. And this sort of tribe takes him in and very soon someone in the tribe kind of offers the hand of his daughter. Now in the movie, the daughter sort of seems to be about 18, 20 years old, but in reality she was about 13 years old. And um, I don't really like the film for that reason. I sort of feel like it is trying to normalize or just it depicts things in a way that's that's not absolutely accurate in kind of fundamental ways and, and, and I don't really like that. So I'm not sure why. I don't particularly like Gorgar as a person or a character either. I, I'm, I quite like his art, but um, I certainly don't have the interest in Gorgar that I have in uh, Van Gogh. Um, I appreciate the surface area that, that is a different person and a different approach. But as a man and so on, I'm not particularly interested in him. And I don't know if that's the reason. I just wasn't particularly interested in the movie either. I, I struggled to watch through to the end of it. And as a result, I'm not going to be basing this episode. I'm not going to sort of anchor it in the film. Um, you might find this episode a little bit disorienting because there's going to be a hodgepodge, a mishmash of things like quotes, an article, a reference to another documentary from the BBC. I think it's called A Dangerous Life or something like that. And um, so there's going to be a little bit of a swirl of, of sources that I'm going to be using to, to tell my story about Gorgar. Before I get to the sort of before the Yellow House and after, I just want to speak a little bit more about Vincent Cassell's portrayal of him in the movie. So pretty early on, you sort of see him in kind of a ramshackle scenario. He's beaten down. He's unkempt. He's probably quite smelly. He's, he, he kind of looks like a bum. He kind of looks like an alcoholic that is stumbling around through the backwoods and shacks in somewhere in Tahiti. And it doesn't look very nice. It certainly doesn't feel like paradise. It doesn't look very like, um, you know, a holiday on a beach at all. It, it kind of looks like poverty and suffering and misery. That's kind of what it looks like. And in the midst of this, there's also sickness. Gorgar has some kind of um, health problem and he kind of has a heart attack. He goes into the hospital, as I mentioned earlier. The doctor kind of gives him instructions and the next thing, Gorgar has disappeared. And the, the doctor, I think, finds him later on and then says, you've got to come back to hospital. You're gonna, you need to be responsible. And that prompts, you know, he, he says to Gogo, you, you've been totally irresponsible. And Gogo kind of turns around and he responds, why are you so responsible? You know, are you a responsible person? And he then gives the doctor a letter, I think, to his, his wife or his ex-wife. Bear in mind, this is his wife with five children. He's living in Tahiti drinking and carousing and whatever, and he's giving the doctor the letter. He's kind of saying, are you going to let me off the hook? Are you going to let me 
not go back to the hospital? Are, are you going to take this letter and post it and kind of go along with what I want to do? And he, he kind of, one of the things he says to the doctor is, you know, before I die, I want to see particular mountains. And I guess the doctor takes pity on him and turns and, and leaves with the letter. But the part that I think we need to address here is think about this idea of responsibility. So this is his own health that's at stake. He's just had a heart attack. He's in a serious situation. You could even say life and death in a way. You know, the fact that the doctors left the hospital to find him, to try and get him to come back to the hospital. And it's this discussion about responsibility and lack of responsibility. Now think about that in the context of what happened to Van Gogh and his ear. Irrespective of whether you think Gauguin was responsible directly or indirectly, the fact that he left when he did was very irresponsible. The fact that, so let's say you take the scenario that Gauguin had nothing to do with it. In other words, he didn't cut off Vincent's ear. Van Gogh almost died himself. He nearly bled to death. So irrespective of who did it, this guy who he'd been living to with for eight weeks, he abandons immediately. It's kind of like he washes his hands and he's gone. And that is very irresponsible. Now, now you've got to ask yourself, if you're thinking about it from a true crime perspective, what is more likely that someone who's a criminal would do something and run away and, and kind of be irresponsible and, and not want to account for what they did, right? And so you do something and you run away from it and you, you lie about it. Or that you're innocent and you run away and you lie about it. Or you run away and you don't deal with it. Or you, 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 you didn't do it, but you're irresponsible. And... The arguments against and in favor of both those scenarios, but I think you can certainly see that there's it, it's not a it's not a case that Goga is kind of an upstanding gentleman. That's kind of my point. And although I think we've established that Van Gogh wasn't mad, we are now coming to a we, we, we're coming closer to a scenario where we can see something similar with Gorga as well and ultimately you're probably going to be left with a case where both artists are seen as crazy eccentric hedonistic and behaving badly and so you're going to be left with kind of a sense that well Ultimately, it could have been either one of them. Either one of them could have done that. But think about it. If two artists are at loggerheads with one another, if two artists are drunk and insulting and just totally uninhibited, what is more likely that when one artist is going to cut his own ear off or that another one who is a fencer and a boxer and temperamental himself might lash out at this guy, someone who he wants to not live with anyway, someone who he wants to leave anyway, that he might lash out at him. And so I just think when we deal with Gorgas' character, we are getting closer to a scenario that Van Gogh didn't do what he did to his ear as well. But it's not all about the ear incident. We, we also want to get to know Van Gogh through Gorga and kind of the, the the secret side to Van Gogh in terms of, you know, what he did in his private time, you know, what were some of his habits that we don't really know about? What is the hidden side to Van Gogh? And we kind of see this through Gorga, who you know, who, who lived another 13 years after Van Gogh's death. So, so um, as a way to just, gradually introduce you to this film, which I say, as I say, I'm not going to go into, into too much detail, but there's a weird thing here where life imitates art. So you have the actor Vincent Cassell portraying Gorga, and in real life, and this was actually published two days ago on the Daily Mail, it turns out that 
Vincent Cassell, who's 53 years old, has is, is sort of married to a much younger woman who's 22 years old. She's less than, way less than half his age. And she's kind of got a, um, she, she's of a, de a different ethnic um, makeup to, to what he is. I'm not sure exactly what she is, but the, the part I want to emphasize is there's definitely a um, optic, uh, in terms of the optics, there's, there's sort of a link between the guy playing Goga in, on, in, in Tahiti with these much younger women of a different ethnicity and Goga in, not Goga, Vincent Cassell in real life in the same thing. To me, the, the, the ethnicity is not such a big deal. The, the, the bigger deal is this sort of thing of a older guy, a much older guy with a much younger woman and it's all fine. Now, I don't see, there's not necessarily anything wrong with it, like even in Vincent Cassell's case. So what if he's twice her age, um, you know, he's, he's not a bad looking guy, he's wealthy and whatever, and it's her choice, right? But you kind of have the other side to it, which is when he was, when the guy who he's depicting was literally a pedophile. It was literally someone who, who took a 13 year old as a wife. And, and that's not, and, and I think he had a few wives there, right? And bear in mind, he's abandoned his, his wife and five children. He's abandoned his, his family to kind of embark on this adventure of debauchery. And that is where it becomes a little bit seedy. And you might say, well, Vincent Cassell's totally different in that respect, but how people found out that he was seeing this woman was she put up a face uh, Instagram post when she was 19 years old of the two of them. And you might even say that is acceptable, but it's coming dangerously close to the whole um, Weinstein thing and Roger Ailes. It's becoming dangerously close to that and it's sort of a weird scenario where is it okay if a, a woman consents to this sort of situation right but then what happens when she doesn't and so I think where I want your thoughts to go is imagine Van Gogh kind of really liking or admiring or I don't know what the word is, just being tickled by this idea of Gogo having success or having whatever you want to call it with much younger women or whatever and, and Van Gogh kind of being influenced by it in some way. Maybe he's appalled by it in the beginning but maybe later on he is intrigued by the idea. Or certainly, or even turned on by the idea, and I'm going to store that idea with you. We're going to address it much later on again, but I just want to leave that with you that that there may be this aspect that was actually quite a bad influence on Van Gogh, and we're going to come back to it in this episode, just sort of lightly. We're going to come back to this aspect. So I want to quickly address this particular aspect through some facts, through anchoring it in something that is established. And so we're going to go to Meta Gorga, which is the great grand granddaughter. And she talks about Gorga signing his name, PGO. So P for Paul, G for Gorga, and then the letter O. And she sort of notes in a particular, one particular interview, she says, well, there's no O in, in Paul Gorga. So, so where is the O coming from? And she said that this was actually his sort of nickname for himself. And she said that this was sailor slang for Pego. It almost sounds like Pedo, doesn't it? 
but it is slang for penis. And so Gorgal was kind of referring to himself in a slang way as a penis. He was sort of identifying himself as kind of a walking erection, I guess, something like that. And so doesn't that give you a sense of sneaky mischief? And it's also putting a different twist on the word savage. You know, he's a savage, but, but kind of in a sexual sense, which makes him theoretically harmless, you know, for some French dude going off into the wilderness and finding a wife, theoretically harmless, but not necessarily. I mean, if you have those, these, those kind of impulses, what, what happens in civilized society? Well, couldn't it lead to chopping off of ears and drunkenness and debauchery and, and worse? It's just important that you bear in mind the way Gorgar self-identified. And that is going to open a whole raft of implications because if you see yourself that way, you're going to, it's going to just create a whole different set of dynamics, right? Including with Van Gogh. It means there are going to be a lot of women now suddenly entering the scene. And what impact is that going to have on two men staying together? And now I want to go through a couple of quotes, uh, starting with this one from Paul Gogar, Absinthe is the only decent drink that suits an artist. So you might have had the impression that maybe Van Gogh was the drinker and Gogar kind of ab abstained. In other words, the one was drunk and the other one was sober. But now what is being revealed here is that very likely Gogar was also a drinker also you know so in a sense they were equals in terms of they were both drinking absinthe a lot and we know that absinthe is just a poisonous and really really dangerous drink to be taking in it is going to cause all sorts of extremely erratic and very very violent behavior it's kind of like you know almost like overdosing on on um on you know cocaine or heroin or something constantly it's just going to cause problems it's going to cause very erratic and then dangerous behavior and, and it, it can't end well and so now you've got to imagine if you go back into the scenario that we know about where van gogh had discovered that his brother was having a baby or sorry no she was he was getting engaged on the 23rd of December the, the night of the ear incident you can imagine Gorgar saying oh that's awesome you know let's go and celebrate let's get drunk let's celebrate your brother's whatever bearing in mind his brother's his patron so he wants to honor this guy with his brother and, and kind of say well congratulations whatever and so one can actually imagine both of them getting totally drunk and in that situation, there is some kind of argument. And what is more likely in, in an argument like that? The one cutting the other one's ear off or the one cutting his own ear off? I know it's almost like 50-50, but it shouldn't be. We, we should be leaning more one way than the other by now. So a couple of other quotes to go through. When he was in Tahiti, he wrote, why work? The gods are there to lavish upon the faithful the good gifts of nature. Now, I just want to talk a little bit about Gorgar's work ethic. When Gorgar went to the Yellow House when he was invited there, for a long time he postponed and delayed. So he's a, he's a kind of guy that you might feel lacks urgency, a kind of guy who seems to be lazy or to be taking his time with things and maybe thoughtful and something like that, right? We are going to deal a little bit later on in this episode with his pace of work, but let me just tell you now already, it's something like he would do 20 paintings in 20 months, right? So that's an average of one painting a month, whereas Van Gogh w could paint 80 paintings or 75 paintings in 80 days. So 
that is a far more far greater output you know by, by a long margin and that had to have rubbed Golgar the wrong way you know this he has a guy who's not relaxed who's not painting slowly and thoughtfully and it's grating him it's grating him how productive this other artist is it's pushing him and nudging prodding and poking him that he needs to do more and get out there and it's like the, you know the one artist inspiration striking constantly like lighting like zzz, 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 constantly and then the other artist is sort of you know i don't know what he's doing he's sort of wandering around mooching around and and then occasionally painting of course the paintings that he he, he does work on are are quite exceptional but so are van gogh's right so we previously looked at his contemporaries calling Gauguin a savage, but that is even how he thought of himself. He once wrote, I begin to feel an enormous need to become savage and to create a new world. Now, I don't think one's got to conflate that word with necessarily how we think of the word savage today, which is brutality, which is violence. I don't think that that's necessarily what he's talking about i think he's talking more about being more primitive being more connected to nature being more based in your desires and and in other words getting unplugging out of the materialistic world out of civilization and plugging into um you know the mud and the the water and the rain and the leaves of um, an island somewhere, something like that, right? And that is kind of what he's talking about. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that it excludes violence and anger and physical contest and all that kind of thing, right? So bear in mind, when he went to Tahiti, he, he wanted to live off the land, he wanted to hunt, he wanted to pluck fruit off the trees and eat it almost like the garden of eden he wanted to have sex with the locals he wanted to have probably even orgies or threesomes or whatever um, so he wanted to engage more in that part of himself but you can also imagine if someone is arguing with you and that is your mentality in other words you are wanting to be a free spirit and you're wanting to be irresponsible or something like that and someone is now caging you in their philosophy or their beliefs or their ideas of what you should be doing you're going to strike out even more than you would normally do because you are in you you in this phase of expansion and you can almost equate what i'm talking about here in in true crime terms to amanda knox and chris watts so when, when the crime happened with Meredith Kircher, Amanda Knox was also expanding herself, giving in to just, you know, she was, she was trying to enjoy youth at, at university and, and all, all the things that that implies. Chris Watts was trying to enjoy the freedom and the, I guess, the pleasures and the fantasies and the, and the hedonism of having an affair. And, so what I'm trying to get at is when you try to embrace that fairy tale, when you try to enjoy these freedoms and someone comes and starts impinging on them and threatening them, the response can sometimes be extremely um, uncivilized, to put it mildly. Do, do you see what I'm getting at? So there's a relationship in the between the um, reaching out for freedom and for the sense of less responsibility and doing something that is kind of antisocial, like committing a crime, like hurting someone else, right? Now, you may recall in the previous episode, I spoke about other technological forces that were 
unfolding at the time. I was also talking about how medicine, as it kind of a technology was developing, how the Eiffel Tower was being constructed at the time and, and engineering was in process. So kind of what was happening at this time was civilization was getting its getting into its stride. It was gaining momentum. Um, cities were starting to fix themselves and arrange themselves and, and so were the people inside those cities. And art was reflecting this, and I'm going to deal with that in a second, but also the people. The people were being arranged and, and things that people recognized. You know, the countryside was, was disappearing behind kind of the hemline of the city um, silhouette or the, you know, the, the outline of the, the, the city or the, I wouldn't call it the suburbs then, but you know what I'm getting at, where the countryside just starts receding and all those little communities and little, um, little forests and, and little places were just starting to be trampled over and, and lost. And Tolkien recognized this and, and, and was saddened by it. And that process is still underway today. It's very advanced now. Probably some of the, the best of those natural communities have been lost now. But in Gorgar was also seeing it and, and, he, and he couldn't bear it. And he wanted to go where he wasn't going to see that. He wanted to go back to the, the, the old world. In a way, he wanted to regress, I guess. Anyway, one of the technologies he talks about is photography. And he says, do you know what will soon be the ultimate in truth? Photography. Once it begins to reproduce colors, and that won't be long in coming. And yet you want an intelligent man to sweat for months so as to give the illusion he can do something as well as an ingenious little machine can. Um, and you kind of have Gogar griping there where he says, you know, it is kind of admitting that you can sweat for months on a single painting to give the illusion that he can do something ingenious. And so he's quite cynical about his own efforts and his own achievements there. I um, kind of agree with Gogar in the sense that photography has become, uh, you know, and do documentaries that you can see has become... Um, very important, you know, at crime scenes, a very important part of documenting crime scenes is photographing the crime scene. And often crime scene photos have a, a disproportionate importance in court cases. It's where you look at the photo and you say, well, okay, there you see it. There you see the mark or there you see the blood or whatever, right? So photography is very a very powerful medium in truth. In terms of what he says about color, I don't agree. I've worked as a photographer for quite a long time and I quite enjoy photographing flowers and very, very, very often a camera simply can't understand, can't calibrate, can't capture the color in flowers. They just can't. This is especially true with certain tones of red and and blue. and Basically, the camera will sometimes make something too... If it's red, it comes out as pink. If it's pink, it comes out as purple. I just can't seem to see it. And then you realize just how vibrant nature is. In this particular quote, you could imagine Vincent van Gogh wrote it, although not all of it, just the second part, where Paul Gauguin says... I am a great artist and I know it. The reason I am great is because of all the suffering I have done. So this applies to Van Gogh in the sense that Van Gogh today is recognized as a great artist and we all know it. And the reason we think he's great is because of all the suffering he has done, right? But this, this is a quote by Gauguin and he's saying, I am a great artist and I know it. That's the difference between him and Van Gogh. Van Gogh didn't think of himself as a great artist and he didn't know it. He suspected it and he hoped for it and he was working towards it, but by no means would he be so bold to say something like that. He was just 
far too modest. He was far too humble and he was far too busy working to get to be that that person, right? And that Paul Gogar it is totally different. He he sold a fair amount of art. The art community re very much respected him. He was, he, you know, he kind of had a commission from Theo van Gogh. So, you know, he was definitely higher on the, the rung of, um, in terms of artistic achievement than Vincent van Gogh. And it's kind of why Vincent van Gogh was obsessed with him. He wanted to be where Gogar was. So you had this unequal thing going on, except think of where, where we are now with that. Now it's unequal the other way. Now most people know about Van Gogh. Most people like his art. Um, and, you know, for me, the art is different. I would say I also prefer Van Gogh's art to Gauguin's. Some of it I find sickly. Some of it I find just pasty. Some of it I find not bad, one-dimensional. And some of it I find just kind of decorative. I don't really get the, the intensity that, that I think I want in Gauguin's art, whereas it is in, in, in Van Gogh's art. There's, there's something languid and lazy and seedy to me about Gauguin and his art, whereas there may be that in Vincent Van Gogh's art to an extent, but, but because there's an intensity, it's not lazy, it, it is um, something that I think redeems the artist, you know. But I think the important part to stress here is that Gauguin has suffered. He has suffered, and if you put two suffering artists together and you give them alcohol and women, and maybe they argue about women, or maybe they argue about art, or maybe they argue about women, art, money, and everything else, and, and then it's just got to explode, and that is what happened. And so the final quote I'm going to refer to here, which is, I think, also the most important in terms of the story that I'm trying to tell you and convey to you guys, is where he says, the work of a man is the explanation of the man. And that is why Gauguin's art is so important and Van Gogh's art is so important as a way of figuring out what we're talking about here. It's through the art that we're getting an additional dimension to what is really going on. So that's why I say, when you look at Van Gogh's self-portrait of him without his ear, and you look at the colors, it's telling you a hell of a lot about what is going on there, more than what you think meets the eye. When he draws those chairs of the one representing himself, the other one representing Gauguin, it's telling you a heck of a lot at a single glance about how he sees himself as simpler and more inferior to this other person and poorer and all, all the rest. Okay, so from here we're going to go to the letter that Van Gogh and Gauguin wrote about their artistic hopes. And it was something they wrote on kind of a piece of paper from, I think, a, a school book or something. So it just shows you that they had so little money, the pair of them, that they they couldn't buy paper, that they sort of had to use what they could find, right? And so this refers to a article in The Guardian. I'm just going to kind of dip into it here and there. So let's start off a little way into the article where it refers to eight weeks later. So... I don't know if you know this, Gauguin was actually supposed to stay in the Yellow House for between a year and two years. So instead of staying there for two years, he stayed there barely two months. And that, and you can think of that as being quite irresponsible as well. You know, a house was kind of bought or prepared for him to stay in. All this effort was made to accommodate him. And then he, he arrives and then he leaves eight weeks later. You know, you kind of had two brothers who were sort of railing around him to, 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 to sort of, you know, it was kind of a partnership. And Gorgar broke that partnership, right? He kind of broke his contract even. 
And if the news came out that he chopped off Van Gogh's ear, he kind of could have been prosecuted and thrown in jail, but then everyone would have lost. You know, if that had happened, what would have happened? Van Gogh testifying against him in court, right? But then what about the other Van Gogh that's trying to sell his artworks? It's just going to be a big mess, right? Do you, do you see that? In any event, in this excerpt from the, the Guardian, it refers to Van Gogh spending the meager household budget on prostitutes and his refusal to drink absinthe. His refusal to drink, uh, to, his refusal to stop drinking absinthe. So, bear in mind what he's saying here is it is believed. So we don't know this for a fact. It seems to be an accusation that Gogar made of Vincent, saying that this guy kept blowing all their money on prostitutes and he wouldn't stop drinking absinthe. That is either the case, or it was the other way around, or it was Gogar who was blowing the money on prostitutes. Bear in mind, Gogar is the guy who refers to himself as a penis, right? Gogar is the guy who refers to absinthe as the best drink for an artist. So, who was really blowing money on, on women and alcohol? And then the third possibility is that they both were. The, the third possibility is that they were both living large or whatever it was. And they both couldn't handle it or Van Gogh certainly couldn't handle it. But even if that is the case, even if they were both equally guilty of kind of being men behaving badly, if you bear in mind, Van Gogh's work ethic was such as it was. So he was constantly going out, constantly painting, constantly producing. And then you had Gogar producing virtually nothing. So, you know, I've taken you guys through the artworks he executed while he was in all. And it doesn't look like that. It doesn't look like there were more than two or three. And I think that kind of makes sense, given that we know his pace was around about a painting a month when he was when he was sort of on song right if van gogh was painting a lot more then then when could he have been you can kind of imagine van gogh goes out painting and when he comes back there's a prostitute in the house or or gogar's drunk or something like that do you see what i'm saying and that's going to grate you you're going to think well i, I didn't really sign up for this In the letter, Gogar wrote, so this is the letter they wrote together, don't listen to Vincent, as you know, is prone to admiration and ditto indulgence. And so here he is saying something that we know is true. He's prone to admiration, meaning if you flatter him, he'll be flattered. And I mean, we know that happened with Albert Aurier. Remember that. In the beginning, he was upset, I guess, but later on, he was like, wow, I've really been thinking about it, and I'm, you know, whatever. But it also says he's prone to indulgence, and that is certainly true. And that is why he was getting stipends from his brother. Instead of just inheriting all the money from his father when his father died, he was getting, and his father just died you know, a couple of years earlier. Um, he was getting small allotments of money at regular intervals so that he could pace himself with whatever he was going to do with it. So whether it was buying painting supplies or buying alcohol or prostitutes or whatever. But the fact is prior to Theo managing the, his money, Van Gogh was sort of all over the place. He was womanizing, he was sick, he had syphilis like nobody's business. He was constantly embarrassing people and he was all over the place. And so um, you, you, you do get the sense confirmed of 
Van Gogh being very indulgent. But yet you get also this sense of discipline from him. And you really got the sense of discipline from him towards the end of his life, especially the Yellow House, all saint rami Oves, Sauvois period. Do you know what I'm talking about? In other words, this last phase, he seems to have cleaned up his act, doesn't he? But what about Gaga? Has, has Gaga cleaned up his act or is Gaga wanting to become less and less civilized? And it does seem like he, he, he did want to be less civilized. And so I think in a sense he was a bad influence on, on Van Gogh. Artistically, there was maybe electricity which s somewhat inspired work and thought. But I think there was also criticism and negativity around those discussions and arguments. If we go to the next part of the quote, this is something Van Gogh wrote. He said, In Goga, blood and sex prevail over ambition. If you go a little bit backwards through that same statement, again, this is Van Gogh's writing. He says, Now here, without the slightest doubt, we are in the presence of a virgin creature with the instincts of a wild animal. In Gorgá, blood and sex prevail over ambition. And that is giving you that sense of this, this person as a savage, this person having instincts, this person doing what he pleases almost as a hedonist would, right? And look at what he refers specifically to, blood and sex. It's almost like he's talking about violence and kind of th matters of the libido. And the, it's almost like Van Gogh is criticizing this. He's saying, you know, he's putting these things, blood and sex, above ambition. And maybe he's teasing him, but I, I nevertheless think there's, there's, a, there's a, some truth in the joke. Do you follow? And bear in mind what happened to Van Gogh in terms of the ear incident. You had him carrying his ear in, in a newspaper or some kind of paper and giving it to a woman in a brothel. Some say she was a prostitute, others say she was a maid. But you nevertheless have this blood within the context of sex in, in that broad sense. So if we contextualize this letter, we're talking about a letter written in November 1888 in Arles, where, where Vincent had rented two floors of a private house. And this is all really for the benefit of Gorgá. He was sort of the, the honored guest. He'd lived somewhere else prior to that, and, and this was all an expense, an investment in this artist. And this is the part that's important. The previous week, after months of procrastination, Gauga had arrived to live and paint with Van Gogh for one or two years. The important part to observe here is the months of procrastination. So you've kind of got a vision of Gauga as listless and kind of restless and he's, he's not sure where he wants to be. Well, what is he doing when that's happening? Is he painting or is he drinking? Is he painting or is he womanizing? You know, kind of what is going on? And if you compare that to Van Gogh, one thing we know Van Gogh was always doing was painting. And, and that's different with Gauguin. So you can you imagine in any situation two people living together and they in a mutual investment and the one is working constantly and the other one isn't. And the other one is actually seems to be taking advantage. He seems to be just doing whatever he wants. I mean, he, he is the more respected artist, but it seems like he's resting on those laurels. The other contextual part is the French art world was moving from Impressionism to Modernism and Surrealism. 
And Van Gogh and Gogol were part of that movement, I guess. But they they weren't recognized at that point. People were still kind of clinging to the the Impressionism. They were still sort of languishing in that. And so these other artists like Van Gogh and Gogol who were pushing the leading edge outward, the, the world wasn't really ready to accept that. Anyway, it was within this context that the two sort of met early on and at some point very early on in the sojourn together in the Yellow House, they sort of wrote a letter together. And I guess this was too early to for, for, the, for them to have quarreled much, but they probably was already quarreling anyway. But let's just say the relationship, it was so early on that the relationship was still quite good, right? If you refer to the semantics of this article, it refers to the pair quarreling violently. And you've got to ask yourself what that actually means and what that actually looks like. Because we're going to come back to it again and again. When you quarrel violently with someone, why would you cut off your own ear or, or hurt yourself when you're quarreling with another person? When you're arguing with another person, you are wanting to prove a point and wanting to defend something and wanting to attack, right? Your defense of yourself is very unlikely going to be cutting yourself or injuring yourself. It's going to be, if, if it's a violent enough argument, if it's driven hard enough, it is going to end up being a crime, like the murder of Meredith Kircher, like the arguing in the Watts family that precipitated that crime. It is not someone who is going to take it upon themselves and stab themselves in the back, right? Anyway, this article, which was written seven years ago, obviously predating the Knife and Smith book and everything else, it provides the cliche in two very... Um, simple lines, just saying, Van Gogh sliced off his right ear, it was an act that marked the Dutchman's final decline into madness and suicide. That's the popular narrative. That's the well-known mad artist um, myth. And I'm just going to provide a quote from Simon Sharma, just talking about this, what was happening when the two lived together. After barely a month with his new housemate, Gauguin is beginning to feel a serious space problem. In the BBC's documentary on Gauguin, one of the commentators talk, talks about Gauguin hating Van Gogh's use of heavy paint and his messiness of working with it. So... And, and just saying that this was something that drove him absolutely nuts. I don't know whether he me she means messiness as in messiness on the canvas or that it was just like paint everywhere and it was dirty. I don't really know. But I would imagine it's in terms of his technique more. Because if you look at Van Gogh's work and you look at Gauguin's work, they couldn't be more opposite in terms of the one has a, got a very thin layer of paint on it and the other one is couldn't be thicker. I think they call it impasto or impasto. It, it's, it's, the paint is so thick it's almost like sculpture, as someone once said. And so this was driving Gauguin nuts. And he, he, I guess he couldn't stop complaining about it. And so... They have huge fights about pretty much everything, art, woman, money, alcohol, whatever they're going to be doing. And um, you've got to imagine how arguments can escalate over two months. And again, if you compare this to the Amanda Knox case, how long did Amanda Knox stay with Meredith Kircher? So 
it was also a case of someone moving into someone else's house, right? And in this case, you had Meredith Kirchis staying there before Amanda Knox stayed there. Amanda Knox moving in, almost like Gorgar moving in. And, and after a pretty short time, they were having arguments as well. And, and who, who suffered? Who was the victim in that case? The person who kind of lived there, Meredith Kircher, the person who was sort of originally there. And if you think about Amanda Knox, she was, she was sort of not at home. She was somewhere else when all of this supposedly happened. You have the same thing with Gorgai. He, he was, oh, that night he, he stepped into a hotel. And we kind of get a little clip in the same BBC documentary where just going over Gorgar's version of events. So in his own words, he, he talks about the ear incident and he says, I turned about on the instant as Vincent rushed towards me. So he, he's talking about being outside of the yellow house, walking, I guess, in an alley or in the road and and he said Vincent rushed towards him, almost like he had his back to Vincent and Vincent now rushed towards him. He doesn't talk about what happened prior to that. He doesn't talk about arguing or shouting or running. I'm talking about in this particular, just in this clip that we're talking about. We don't have that information right here. But you've got to also ask what led to this. Vincent didn't just wake up and rush at him. Why was he rushing at him? What did or God do. That's not acknowledged here. Then Gorgar said Vincent had an open razor in his hand. I don't really get the sense that Van Gogh was a, a violent or a confrontational type. I mean, if there was any place for him to be a problem case, it was in the asylum surrounded by mad people. I mean, think about it. If you are, if you are mad or you are um, somewhat less mad than your fellow man and, and you're thrown into a asylum and you're prone to violence, aren't you going to be sort of smacking and pushing and just letting people know that they're irritating you? Because they are going to be irritating. They're going to be repeating things and doing mad things and you're going to want to get them out of your face. So why were there no incidents in the asylum? Why were there no incidents of, of any phys of, of physical of you know anything of a physical nature? Anyway, so according to Gaga, Vincent approaches him with an open razor in his hand and lowers his head, and he. Oh, so hold on, that is that's according to Gaga he. He, he looked at Vincent. He said, my look at that moment must have had great power in it, for he stopped. So in his story, he says, Vincent sort of skulked up to him from behind, almost like stalking him. And Gogo kind of realized, you know, innocently realized, oh, Vincent's coming up to him. And, and all Gogo did was look at him. And then Vincent stops, turns around and runs away. I don't think that really makes any sense. I, I, I don't think it makes any sense that, that they have violent arguments. But in this case, where, where Vincent's got the intent to harm the guy, all he does is he looks at him. I, I really don't think that that, that that happened. Do you think that that's credible? And then you can imagine where he says lowering his head instead of running towards home. You can imagine that he lost his ear or after he lost his ear, he ran to wherever he needed to go. Like, imagine if you've been attacked or stabbed or something. You might want to run away from the person who did it to you because you don't want it to happen again. And the same thing happened when he was when he supposedly committed suicide. He is injured and then he leaves wherever he was to go somewhere else. Why? Well, it wasn't because someone else injured him. He didn't want to be where the person was that injured him. And in both instances, he ends up in his bed. Is where, where he gets injured isn't where 
he ends up. Does that make sense? The crime scene is somewhere else and then he leaves the crime scene and he ends up going to bed or lying in bed and trying to recover. And there's, there's kind of a sense of woundedness and shame and defeat in, in his actions, right? But it's also the kind of behavior you, you would sort of expect from someone who is either badly wounded or also who may have been so drunk they can't go to the police, they need to sort of sleep it off. They may not be in their right mind either because of uh, intoxication. And then it refers to Gorgar saying he couldn't sleep, basically saying that he slept late. And he couldn't sleep until 3 a.m. and so he woke up late the next morning. Because early the next morning everyone was aware of what had happened to Van Gogh except him. But now the, the problem is... Um, wasn't Goga also drunk that night and also wasn't he carousing? Wasn't he sort of um, sleeping with prostitutes or something? Isn't that why he only got to sleep at 3 a.m.? Because it's kind of a coincidence that on the same night that this happens, he needs to sleep late. And he needs to sleep somewhere else. Food for thought. Then he talks about when he comes home, he's the last person kind of in the whole town to realize something's happened to Van Gogh. And he says he saw a large crowd gathered and the ear was missing close to his head. Now, what I want to bring your attention to again is immediately following this, Gogol returned to Paris and shortly after that he made the sculpture. Now, Van Gogh painted self-portraits of the bandaged ear and at the same time Gauguin made the sculpture and there's clearly quite a lot of blood on the sculpture in on the sort of jug it's, it's kind of a self-portrait right you can see it's a man with a moustache but what he's trying to depict is blood flowing over this person's face or head and I find that quite telling I find it it's almost as if he is putting blood on himself, if that makes sense. He's caught up in the idea of something that he saw. And you may say, you know, maybe God didn't see what happened to Van Gogh. In other words, he didn't see the, the ear coming off his head. But this sculpture suggests otherwise. It suggests something more and maybe even something mischievous and I'll, I'll return to the sculpture later on to explain why I'm saying that so in around about May 1889 something quite significant happened to Gauguin he'd returned to Paris he kind of wanted to go to Paris for quite a while anyway it'd been almost the moment he arrived at the yellow house he wanted to leave and now he had left and now he was in Paris and it was quite an amazing time to be in Paris. The Eiffel Tower was now fully erected, it had been constructed and the World Fair was in full swing and Gauguin attended the World Fair and there was a lot to see. There was different artists' work and the work of engineers and all sorts of things. We'll talk more about the World Fair in, in due course. But the most important thing to point out is that Gauguin goes to the World Fair in May 1889. And when he's there, he sees a reconstruction of a Tahitian village. And that's what, why he decides to go to Tahiti, just because of that. And again, you just get this idea of quite an impulsive guy. A guy who is kind of savage in his impulses. He's just like... Well, I want to go there and Tahiti is almost on the other side of the world to, to Paris, France. I, I don't know if it's if there's a place further away on earth from France than than Tahiti. Maybe Hawaii, I don't know, but um, certainly really far away. And in fact, Tahiti is far away from everywhere. It's in the middle of the Pacific. 
but I want to bring your attention back to a, a particular artwork that everyone was raving about at around about that time by Serrat and Gogar hated it. Gogar hated its prissiness. He hated its civilizedness, if that's a word. He hated its He hated the good behavior and comport of everyone. You know, everyone sort of um, dressed in suits and top hats and so on. And just the domesticated, boring civilian life. You know, he, 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 he wanted something that was less neat and artificial. He wanted to go back to nature and a sort of a more rustic version of nature where you can be yourself or where you can be free or where you can where there's just more nature and more um, less strictures and object obligations less structures that are caging you and he felt that he could get that somewhere else and Ironically, when he went to Tahiti, Tahiti was part of French Polynesia, he, he sort of found himself in a, um, you know, the capital there, which is like a small Paris. So he left a big Paris for a small Paris. And so he quickly had to leave that enclave as well. I think I'm going to end it off here and do a part two on the section where he's in Tahiti. I just want to finish off by showing you a picture of his home in Tahiti. So if there was the yellow house in all in France. There was a kind of a double story house made of wood and straw in, um, in Tahiti. And this house wasn't called the yellow house. It was called in French, the house of pleasure, which in the French language at the time was also meant the house of prostitution. There's not a terrific lot more to say about the Tahiti section, but because this is quite a long episode already, I'm going to cut it short here. In the next episode, we'll deal with Gogar's life in Tahiti, but also his death and what the implications of his death have for the death of Vincent van Gogh. Thank you for listening. If you are enjoying the content on this channel, please like, share, leave a comment, spread the word. You can email links to this channel to other people you think might be interested. You can WhatsApp links, just click on the share button and uh, obviously share on Facebook uh, and Twitter. I'm going to play out with another clip from Simon Sharma where he just talks about some of the feelings Gogar may have been experiencing when he lived with Van Gogh, which I think are also quite important to acknowledge. I hope you're enjoying your weekend and uh, I will see you guys next time. He's irked by Vincent's manic rate of painting. A picture a day, sometimes even more. And he's starting to feel something he never dreamt he'd have to worry about. Envy. Envy of Vincent van Gogh. So he exorcises his jealousy by doing van Gogh as the painter of sunflowers. Slumped in a chair, body and face distorted, as if already a deranged invalid.